Estamos ao vivo aqui no canal Três Vias para falar sobre os grandes livros da civilização ocidental, né, para falar sobre o, o grande movimento nos Estados Unidos em torno é, dos grandes livros, né, promovido aí por é, Mortimer Adler, é, Robert Hutchins, é, um grande movimento do século XX que publicou várias obras, como vocês podem ver aqui, os grandes livros da civilização ocidental. É, o Mortimer Adler ele é conhecido aqui no Brasil mais pelas obras é, como, ler, como Ler Livros, How to Read a Book, Portuguese Version, é, é, também tem outra versão aqui do, do Como Ler um Livro, né? é, A Arte da Leitura, todos pela, pela, por várias editoras, é, também Como Pensar sobre as Grandes Ideias, né? How to Think About Great Ideas, é, e também como falar, como ouvir, é, how, to listen, uh, how to talk and how, how to listen. É, então, o Mada publicou vários livros aqui e nós temos essa grande oportunidade de conhecer sobre os grandes movimentos. É, o pessoal que está participando agora da live, é, que não entende inglês, a live vai ser toda em inglês, uh, we will speak in English, uh, mas uh, vocês podem deixar as perguntas em português, que eu vou tentar fazer as traduções, e apresentar é, as perguntas para ele, para que ele possa responder. Então, é, dessa forma, logo depois que a live estiver disponível, eu vou apresentar para vocês a, as legendas, eu vou fazer as legendas em português e disponibilizar aqui mesmo no, no próprio YouTube. So, uh, hello Fred Butley, it's a great honor to have you here. Welcome. Yes, thank you, Eduardo. So, uh, I will introduce you in Portuguese first, to our audience. Uh, eu vou apresentar para vocês quem é o Fred Butler. Ele é um professor uh, atualmente da Universidade de Chicago. Uh, e ele uh, participa do movimento dos grandes livros. né? Ele é PhD em História, também pela Universidade de Chicago. E ele também uh, é instrutor, né? liberal art instructor, uh, na Graham School of Continual Liberal and Professional Studies, na, também na Universidade de Chicago e ele lida com o, o movimento dos grandes livros, né, que eu mencionei, que é esse grande movimento, que tem uma série de publicações é, que começa desde a época de Homero até Freud em diante, com mais de 50 e tantos volumes, né, que participa aí com as grandes ideias. Né? E, então, é realmente muito interessante fazer uma live assim, internacional, e vocês podem participar. Então, eu já não vou falar mais em português, agora eu vou falar só em inglês. Uh, so, Fred, uh, We will start with simple questions. Uh, first of all, what is a great book? <laughs> That's a big question. Uh, it's a good to start out. Thank you very much for uh, the honor of having me on the show. Uh, that's a big uh, topic as we talk about what makes a book great. And there, uh, there's much debate about that. Uh, but one of the things that Mortimer Adler did is he actually set up Uh, six criteria for what makes a book great. And I wanted to, to go through at least to some of them uh, because there's so much debate about that, uh, what specific type of book is a great one. Uh, and so I thought I'd sort of start by explaining those ideas that uh, Mortimer Adler had, uh, criteria to what makes a book great. So the first is it's a bestseller and it has been a bestseller for centuries. Uh, it's estimated that uh, Homer's Odyssey has sold upwards of maybe a hundred million people have read that book. Uh, not something that that's uh, something that's popular for a time, but rather speaks across the ages. That's one of the the criteria. Uh, a second is they're popular, uh, not pedantic. They're not written by specialists for specialists, but by a general intelligent audience. Uh, a third is that they are always contemporary. They speak to us about the great ideas. Uh, and these are ideas that are inherent in the human condition. Uh, and so they speak across countless ages uh, to our uh, current experience. Uh, as Mortimer Adler put it, the great books are not faded glories. They're not dusty remains for scholars to investigate. They're not a record of dead civilization rather than the most important civilizing force in the world today, which is a rather bold claim that he made in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, there's a few other criteria, but those uh, are, are really good, helpful ones. They speak to the great ideas, they're popular over centuries, and they speak to our contemporary moment. 
Um, and I want to know, uh, is there a difference between uh, the great books and uh, the concept of classic book? The concept of what? Classical? Cla classical book. Uh, there's some. Uh, if you go back to the idea that a classic is that which is taught in class, uh, someone said uh, a classic is someone that everybody looks at but never reads, uh, but I don't think that's what we really mean. Uh, a classic is what is sort of a center of a curriculum. Uh, and there, if you look at the, there is a significant amount of overlap between a classical book, uh, but also in, in a great book. But if you go back to the, what we call the classical age, uh, that's the age of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. There, we need to see that the great books is an idea that is much broader than that, even moving into to books into the 20th century. And uh, uh, I want to know ab about good books. What what's the difference of great books, good books, and uh, bad bad books? <laughs> bad books. Uh, well, one of the things uh, that I really enjoy uh, is going back to Francis Bacon. Uh, he's a philosopher from the 17th century, uh, late 16th, early 17th century, and he talked about books. The kind of a book to, uh, and he has this really interesting metaphor. Some books are to be tasted some chewed and others to be swallowed and digested. Uh, what that means is some books are just to be read in a very superficial way because they don't really speak uh, to really serious ideas. Others can be read by somebody else or to be read uh, in an inspectional way, but others really need to be wrestled with and sort of become part of your own soul in many ways because they speak to you. Uh, and so there is a difference between a book that is good and a book that is great. A good book is something that you read and, and you get something out of it, but maybe you, maybe your friends, maybe a given age, maybe in Portugal or maybe in Brazil or maybe in the United States, but it doesn't speak across uh, the ages and across centuries. So a book like Homer's Odyssey is something that we can understand uh, and really get into, really to live the experience of the characters that are there, like Odysseus. Uh, and his crew as they traveled on their journeys. And that's something that that is really part of a great tradition. Uh, and that's something that I wanted to, to talk about as we look at great books, but then an idea that really Mortimer Adler coined, and that's the great conversation. Uh, and that's a tradition that goes 2,500 years in the West of authors wrestling with the same ideas and talking back and forth one with another. Um. You talk about the great conversation. <laughs> it's a, a book here, uh, Hobbit, uh, and it's, it's fantastic, isn't it? the substance of our liberal education. Please tell us about uh, the great conversation, uh, how we can participate in, in it. And that's something that, that we want to see that the Great Conversation, this is uh, an idea that Morton Radler coined for the first time it had ever been used was in 1946, when he puts together a manual or a training guide to help teachers or instructors like me teach about the great books. Uh, and he uses that as the great conversation. Uh, and there, I want to use kind of a metaphor that, that he was uh, very common that we do around the University of Chicago. Uh, and that's, as you teach, you're not doing this as a lecturer, teaching to a group of students who are sitting there passive, but rather you're all around a conversation, we're all around a table. Uh, and the students and the, the instructors, uh, we sit around the table because in many ways, the teacher is the guide. Uh, we've all read the text, but we all have the possibility to contribute. And it's interesting that uh, you showed the, his first uh, edition of how to read a book. And then he, that book came out in 1940. And he doesn't use the expression, the great conversation in there, uh, but he uses a metaphor of a conversation. And it's very interesting because when we look and see oftentimes uh, you get intimidated or people get intimidated by the great books. Uh, but there, I did a, a close study of how Mortimer Adler uses the word conversation in how to read a book. And what it is, it's always of you getting involved in the conversation. And so one of the things I think that we need to see is that we are able to participate 
in the great books, in the great conversation. Uh, we can read and see how Hegel is arguing with Kant, who is arguing with Nietzsche, who is arguing with, with Sigmund Freud and, and others. And we can participate in that as that book and that conversation on the great ideas comes to life. Uh, I would like that to talk about great ideas, uh, about this concept of great ideas. Um, how is the importance of great ideas in, in these uh, works and these books? That's a good question, uh, because Mortimer Adler says the great conversation is about the great ideas. And it's one of the things that makes a book great is that it is engaged in this conversation with others across time about the significant questions that humans have to face. What does it mean to live? What it means to uh, experience relationships? What does it mean to have a soul? Uh, what does it mean to govern oneself uh, or to govern others? What is the nature of good government? These are kind of questions that societies and individuals have to answer. Uh, and we can listen and learn for what others in the past have described. Uh, is to be what makes a good life, for example, ethics questions, morals questions. And uh, uh, could you please explain uh, the concept of Western world or Western civilizations that, that is great books of the Western world? And then what is Western world in this concept? In, in the concept is, uh, really a tradition that dates back not only to the ancient Greeks, uh, but also I would say the ancient Hebrews. Uh, if you wanted to look at some cities, for example, to see uh, where this tradition is, uh, one of the questions that was asked in the early uh, uh, part of this millennium, or last millennium, uh, in the second century, uh, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? And so Jerusalem is going to be one of the key places. Uh, Athens is going to be one of the key places. Rome, also Paris, uh, London, and some other cities that we want to see as part of a long tradition that is the interaction between um, the Hebraic or Judeo-Christian culture and the classical, the Greco-Roman culture. Uh, and one of the things that I like to do and to, to look at what the West means, I kind of, I'm a historian by training and I, I kind of like uh, dates uh, in some ways. So you can keep, you know, a number of them in your head, not a 30 or 40 of them, but a good 10 or 15. Uh, and one of my favorite dates is the year 800. Uh, especially on Christmas Day. Uh, Christmas Day in the year 800 is when the Emperor Charlemagne uh, was crowned Emperor of the Romans by the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. And to me, what that symbolizes, what other historians symbolizes, is the combination of three traditions coming together in one moment. The Judeo-Christian, or the Jewish and Christian, uh, the Greco-Roman and the Germanic, because Charlemagne was a Frankish or Germanic king. And so those three together make up what really what Europe is. Uh, and then Europe expands uh, in colonization uh, with language, etc. And so Brazil is going to be part of that strong Western tradition. We'll have other traditions within it, uh, but it does become part of that broad Western tradition. And there, that's a tradition that goes back really to the beginning, the invention of the alphabet, the invention of writing. Uh, and even before that, uh, if we look, because Homer, one of the earliest things, uh, one of the earliest texts in that Great Books of the Western World series that you see behind you, uh, that's an oral text, an oral tradition. Uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, those are sung by bards around the campfire and then later are written down, maybe in about 800 uh, BC, BCE. And so that's a, a long tradition that interacts one with another, that fights with one another about the significance ideas. It's a contested tradition. It's one that's not a, a, a received view that you just accept on the basis of authority, what people in the past have had to say, but rather you engage with that tradition. So one of the things, and maybe I should pause and see if you you want another question, but uh, one of the things about the West is you have to define it against another tradition, right? There's an East too. 
uh, I want I want to know how did you interest in in this study the great books? How how you, you start to see the importance of this work? How did I start? Uh, that was in university, uh, right when I got introduced to some of these texts. Uh, but the problem is I was at American you know, public university, and too often uh, they were given just in a textbook. Someone was telling you what Socrates said. Uh, and maybe you got a couple short paragraphs or something like that as you explain some of the ideas that Aristotle was describing. Uh, and that was very frustrating to me because I didn't get, I got to hear it secondhand. Uh, and that's common in many American universities uh, that the professor just gives you secondhand or a, a, a secondary source uh, and you don't get the primary, you don't get the, the original, the words that are present. And so one of the things uh, kind of was disappointed with my undergraduate education. Uh, and so maybe this is a, a maybe personal, but a friend of mine and I, uh, he was smarter than I was, uh, uh, but he was also dissatisfied. And when we graduated from university, we decided to devote uh, every Friday night uh, to a two, three hour session where we would closely study some key texts. And we did that for about oh, eight, nine months uh, and, and really engage with the authors and what the authors were trying to, to accomplish in those uh, original editions. And then that led me to graduate school uh, because I knew I needed to, to learn additional uh, material, especially additional engagement with certain specific texts. And then to continue the story, uh, when I was in graduate school, I was graduate school at the University of Chicago in history, and there was what uh, the University of Chicago's Graham School still does. Uh, it's called the Basic Program on Liberal Education for Adults. And I applied to become an instructor. Uh, and that was when I was probably, I was about... Uh, probably about 27, 28, somewhere in there. Uh, and I realized, uh, well, um, you know, one of the, the things, I was kind of intimidated by it. Uh, and so it was exciting for them to, to offer me a position to teach. I was instead offered another job as a professor, and so I, I went that route. Uh, but it, what I would do is I would teach, and I was teaching a number of sections on the history of Western civilization. I would use the texts of the great books to teach them through that, uh, through my Western Civ courses to undergraduates. And then uh, through a different academic career, I went a number of different jobs and worked in government for a while. Then I came back to the University of Chicago's Graham School as their associate dean overseeing liberal arts. Uh, all the liberal arts programs, including the Graham School's Great Books program. And I figured, why not take it? Uh, so I actually took, uh, when I was in my 50s, uh, I started a four-year uh, curriculum in the Great Books as well and finished a couple years ago. So I've been doing this uh, for decades on and off, uh, trying to understand the, the ideas that are present in, in the Great Books in the West. And um, who who is Mahatma Adler, Robert, Robert Hutchins? What what is the importance of this man in, in this great movement? Uh, in some ways, we want to look at the the team that Mortimer Adler and Robert Maynard Hutchins are. Uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins was president of the University of Chicago. Uh, he actually was the youngest president at twenty nine years old. Uh, they named him president, and he's probably uh, one of the top five university presidents in the United States in the 20th century. Uh, and he really transformed the university and really gave it uh, a distinctive orientation. Uh, he was the one to, brought, to bring Mortimer Adler into the University of Chicago, and it was a team. The two of them uh, tried to transform the university's curriculum. Uh, the faculty fought them on it, uh, and after a while, uh, Mortimer Adler and, and Hutchins really thought about going someplace else, but instead, uh, two of their colleagues, uh, Stringfellow Barr and uh, Scott Buchanan, ended up going over to St. John's College. Uh, in Maryland, in Annapolis, and they transformed their great books program, uh, or they transformed their whole curriculum on the basis of great books. 
Then what uh, Hutchins and Adler decided to do, uh, really what Hutchins and Adler decided to do when Hutchins became president, he brought Adler into the university. Uh, and the two of them taught a course uh, for honor students as freshmen in the great book starting uh, 1930. And they continued that uh, as long as, as Hutchins was president. Uh, and they tried to fight with the faculty to get most of the great books being taught, the faculty fought back. And so one of the things that Hutchins and Adler did is they moved outside. Uh, they created first a program for adults, uh, adult education, and they called it the basic program, a liberal education for adults. It's 75 years this year. It started in 1946 and it's gone fully online. Uh, now in this age of, of COVID. And so we have students from Argentina and, and Brazil and Chile, uh, from Germany, from Japan, from Singapore, uh, all throughout the, the, the world. So it's, it's now a great conversation worldwide. Uh, we've been able to do it just in a similar kind of format here, but we still do it around the table or, or a metaphorical table. Uh, this is a program that is designed not for, uh, um, well, many of the students who are there are people in mid-career uh, who realized that they didn't get as much of an education that they needed back in university or in high school. Uh, and now they're, they're uh, engaging with these texts in their 40s or their 50s, uh, or even, well, the oldest student we had was 94. Uh, and she completed the program. So uh, these are books, and this is one of the things that Adler uh, reminded of, reminds us of, is that these are texts that pay rereading. I read a number of them numerous times, as well as taught them a number of times. And each time I get something uh, new out of there, uh, some new insight that I didn't see before. And oftentimes uh, I get that by one of my colleagues, uh, one of my fellow students of these great books who are uh, engaging with me and saying, you know, didn't you see this? Or what does this exactly mean? And I can give you some examples. It's fascinating to, to see. Uh, first question, Wesley. Okay. But in your opinion, which book written in recent years will be a classic book in the future? Uh, that's a, a very good question. Uh, somewhat, and, and here, um, I'm going to answer it in a little different ways. Uh, partly because what's happened since, let's say, not to pick an arbitrary date, but since 1900, uh, 120 years ago or so, what's happened is uh, sort of public culture, public discourse has so fragmented in numerous different ways, uh, different types of literature, but also different types of subjects. And one of the things that I'm seeing uh, behind Eduardo, uh, that set of great books of the Western world, uh, and there you see it and you realize that I think the last book in there, that's the new set, right? The last book in there is probably from about 1920, right? Yes, yes, yes. From about, the first, a years, <laughs> from about 100 years ago. And, and I was actually trying to push the, uh, uh, the instructors uh, when I was associate dean to try to push them to incorporate more contemporary literature in, in there. And they, partly because when Adler and Hutchins put that set together, uh, that's in 1952. And then the latest book was from about 1911, 1913. So that's 40 years later, right? Uh, now it's 100 years old. Uh, and I think now we should try to think what is the best book uh, maybe published prior to 1970, let's say. How's that? Uh, as opposed to something that, that could be classic uh, in the future. So I'm not really going to answer that question. How's that? Uh, what do you think, Eduardo? Uh, it maybe get me thinking in a certain specific topic. Uh, I don't have an opinion about this. <laughs> okay. it's, it's very difficult to, to define uh, what classical in today. No? Uh, Alistair Darwin asks you here. I'm, I may come back to that question as I think about it, okay? But, but keep going, yeah. Uh, please give uh, five or more uh, books that students 
have to be to begin or must use to to begin to start okay. studying. What uh, good books to get? And some I'm going to ask. Uh, maybe I can ask him. I don't know if he's he's able to to type that quick. In what specific field? If we want to look at the, the question of great books, but maybe in what specific field? And here I want to yeah. uh, talk a little bit about something. Ele está falando aqui, Alex, é, cinco livros para começar, é, em qual campo específico é, dos, dos grandes livros, que são vários temas, né, são várias, várias ideias, então você tem que especificar para ele para saber começar a estudar em qual campo. Aí ele vai te, te dar a resposta é, a, a adequada aqui. Né? Let me see another question. Um, Vitor Silva. Uh, what what are uh, your your more most important books of your life? Most important book of your life. <laughs> What's the most important book of my life? Uh, one of the things that I read all the time uh, is the Bible. Uh, the Bible is not in that great, series. Great, 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 great book. <laughs> and and I actually wrote a, a I gave a talk on this and wrote a small paper. Uh, they asked Hutchins about it. Uh, and he said, quote, the Bible is assumed. Uh, the Bible Super is assumed great. in there. Uh, <laughs> so, so the Bible is one key uh, text that I, I, I read daily, and uh, just sections of it, several chapters. Uh, another book that I really engage constantly with is Aristotle's Ethics. Aristotle's Ethics is a foundational uh, text about what the meaning of virtue is. Uh, that's a central text that I read. Um, and I've read it numerous times. Uh, let's see, another, and some I read outside the that canon that's up there. Um, let's see, I really read and go back to sections of Plato's Republic. Uh, that I go back to numerous times. Uh, there's some in mid-century I've been reading, or, or in the middle of the text, in 17th, 18th century. I've been teaching a course uh, over the last year, and this is on, on civilization, the relation between techne and Sophia, uh, technology and wisdom. Uh, and so I've been uh, wrestling with questions, uh, many of which come from Francis Bacon and the Nouveau Organum uh, in the advancement of knowledge. There I've gotten uh, quite a bit in this last year to wrestle with some of those. Um, let's see. And, and there, and, and here, I want to answer the previous fellow's question about what some of the, uh, uh, some of the best books are in a given field. And that's why I was kind of asking if he could do a follow-up, uh, partly because of how uh, Mortimer Adler conceptualizes that set behind there, behind you, that great books of the Western world. And one of the things, as he conceives it, is he goes back and talks about this great conversation that lasts for 2,500 years. But as we think about it, uh, certain texts and certain disciplines are, I mean, the most recent is the one that is most important. So if your, your listener uh, is in physics or in biology, uh, yes, you should have a broad grasp of maybe of Euclid or um, uh, Vesalius, uh, some of which are in the great books. But really, if you want to understand how the nature of the body is, the really books passed in the last 10 years, that is going to be one of the most important. And so as I've been looking at the question of technology or techne and Sophia in this course, uh, I, you pick and choose sections because uh, technology or, or uh, science is one that advances and it is progressive. Whereas a wisdom tradition, like many of the great books, that does not progress or at least progresses in a quite a bit different way. Uh, someone has that uh, sort of a question, um, can you super, I mean, you clearly can go uh, beyond what Isaac Newton uh, is in his conception of the universe. Uh, the Principia Mathematica, uh, it's one of the great books behind you, uh, but that's not what you really want to read if you want to understand post-Einsteinian physics uh, or how the nature of the universe is in its physical realm. 
But if you want to understand what the nature of the human is, or what must I do, uh, or what should I do, there, I mean, Immanuel Kant is very helpful. So is Aristotle. So is Jesus. And the notion of advancing, I mean, uh, uh, we know no more than Newton does about how the universe works. So the most recent thing in physics or in biology or in chemistry, those are things that are, are uh, those are better. Those are greater in some ways. Yes, we could say of Newton, he stood on the, the shoulders of giants. Uh, but yes, we now as humans know more about the natural and biological world uh, than Harvey did when he talks about, discovers the circulation of the blood. That's one of the, the texts that's up there. Uh, but do we know more ethically about how to live than Jesus and Socrates? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and so there, we need to go back in specific fields, uh, things like ethics or politics in some ways, or how to govern ourselves. There, the great books can provide that Sophia, that wisdom that is essential to understand. And so that, as a historian, I would sort of say, it depends on the field. Some things, the most recent is the best. Uh, that, But in many other fields, especially regarding the nature of what it means to be human. That's something that the ancients have enormous amounts to teach us, uh, as well as those in the early modern and, and sometimes even the modern period. Uh, I've noticed many of the more recent texts don't engage as much with questions uh, that did, say, Plato, for example. But uh, maybe that can help with the the your listener's question. So nice. Uh, Ricardo Martins uh, is questioning, uh, what is uh, the moral effect of uh, the great books in uh, imaginative uh, contemporary? And uh, we have, uh, I, well, I, I have to say, many trash in internet. So uh, his question is, what, what is books that uh, give us a good moral? Uh, so to paraphrase the question, what are books that teach morals effectively? Is that what you yes. say? Yes. Okay. Um, and there, there I'm going to uh, push a little bit against Adler in some ways. Uh, Mortimer Adler, uh, as those texts behind, as you look at those great books, uh, one of the things I think looking at them, uh, there's not a lot of history in there, is there? Uh, in what Adler describes as the great books. And, and me as a historian uh, really sees that history can teach often by example. Uh, and so many of the history texts uh, I would go back to is showing how uh, individuals live in certain ways. Um, but then uh, one of the, the figures that I've been looking at closely uh, describes uh, literature, great literature, uh, as a means of experimenting with the human. Uh, it's very difficult in some ways to experiment with humans, right? Especially without their consent. Uh, although governments kind of do that all the time as they try to see what one policy will be versus another. Uh, but in literature, you can, and like novels, like great novels. Uh, you can experiment with how human lives are going to work out in certain ways. And so uh, one of the key texts, one of the most important, uh, is Dostoevsky. Uh, especially the Brothers Karamazov uh, is one that I would highlight is one that shows a question of how one can live or how one should live. But it's texts of great literature that we oftentimes uh, teach in class as a means of kind of experimenting with other kinds of lives. Does that sort of answer your, your uh, listener's question on there? And so sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the great books sometimes appear, or at least someone who's not familiar with it, of is very didactic, of a lecture of how one should live. Instead, oftentimes, there are questions like what, what uh, uh, Socrates asks in the Republic, uh, what is justice? Uh, and he talks about what is justice. Uh, or in uh, the Mino, uh, can virtue be taught? 
or is it something that you're inborn with? Uh, and as you think about those questions, you provide some very interesting examples of how a life should be examined. Uh, the unexamined life is not worth living, as Socrates is going to say. And so the nature of one's examination is there. Uh, and I've noticed also something that Adler doesn't talk too much about, uh, but I've been thinking about it quite a bit recently. Uh, and that's an expression that uh, Socrates makes uh, in the uh, dialogue, the Phaedrus. It's right at the end of the Phaedrus. And he, somebody... Phaedrus is the inocula, um, the person he's talking with and talking to. And Socrates raises the, a story about the invention of the alphabet, uh, the beginnings of writing. And if you notice the great books, they're all written. And Socrates is sort of says, some of you think that writing is a great invention and you're all excited about it, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, but indeed there will be something lost. And in fact, as you write something down, you will lose your memory. And so instead of having wisdom, you only have the semblance of wisdom. Uh, and thinking about it now, as we're in an oral age, uh, it's much more important to be able to talk about a text, to read with someone and engage back and forth with that other person. Uh, and Socrates talks about this as well in the Phaedrus right after he says that. Uh, it's kind of like a, a painting. You know, a book is like a painting that's written down and you can't ask the author the questions. You can't ask him, what does you mean by this? And so there, uh, going back to Adler, he has a, a, one of my, my favorite quips. Uh, he says that, that uh, reading alone is as dangerous as drinking alone. Uh, and there you always want to be uh, in relation one with another, which is why I like to use the great conversation rather than the great books, because really the great books are what uh, gives flesh to that great conversation. We're the ones we, we have the or we're the ones to give flesh to that great conversation. We can wrestle with uh, Immanuel Kant about what I can know truly know, uh, or what should I act, or what should I, what may I hope? Uh, but there we have to translate it into a contemporary context, because uh, Adler is not doing this to be uh, an antiquarian, but rather to make it so that we can better live now. And that means we have to interact back and forth. And so uh, I have your listeners have a group together to read a couple key texts. And so go ahead. We can ask some more questions if if uh, uh, he uh, he clarified clarify that that question and ah, make, okay. it, make a translation. Uh, Mr. Fred, what advice would you give to a beginning student who intends to take the first steps to obtain an education independent independent of the ideological academic system? Uh, and I add uh, uh, I add to that. Um, how to begin in a, a liberal education? That's a good question. Uh, and there you want to find a place or find a group of people uh, that can really engage in a liberal way. Uh, and and there, there are some very clear texts that are present, right? And you do need guides for many of them. Uh, the great books, uh, oftentimes, you need someone to help read with you. Uh, that's something that, that's helpful. One of the first things, though, that easy book uh, is a question of method. Uh, Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book. That's a very good place to start. And Eduardo, you, you're sort of bringing it up. Uh, but there he describes some different kinds of reading. Uh, yes, there it is. Uh, some different kinds of reading. And that actually, you can Google this. You can go to uh, Google and, and or whatever search engine you have and look up Francis Bacon, B-A-C-O-N, of study. His essay mm -hmm. of study. I don't know if you've read that, Eduardo. Uh, it's only about a page long, uh, and that's sort of the, the key text on Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book. But that would be the place to start, uh, Bacon's Of Study, then Adler's How to Read a Book. After that, then 
what I would do is you could actually take a look at many of the texts that are in Adler's Great Books of the Western World. Uh, and I'll plug this, you can find other programs too. Uh, but the University of Chicago's Graham School of Liberal and Professional Studies does have a program called the Basic Program in Liberal Education for Adults. Uh, it's a four year program of three hours a week, uh, 30 weeks a year. Uh, it's significantly cheaper than most private universities. Uh, and it's done, you can do it online. But that is a curriculum that's systematic, that works through most of those great books in a group of about 12 to 15 people. Uh, and there, there as you start, and, and one of the things we do uh, that's there, we start with uh, uh, reading the Mino, uh, Plato's Mino, and reading it very closely. Uh, there we're using Mortimer Adler's uh, analytic method of reading. Mortimer Adler is going to lay out four different types of reading. Uh, one is a superficial, and most books you can only read, you only need to read superficially. Uh, the second is inspectional reading. That's the kind of tasting the book, right? Uh, of getting a sense of, do I want to spend a large amount of time on this book. That's a, a method that you can do. You can read a book in an hour in an inspectional way if you're very active in doing it. Uh, but a third way, and this is the most important, is the analytic method. That's Mortimer Adler's close reading of a text to really come to terms with an author. And there oftentimes you read it twice, uh, once very quickly, uh, and then you will go slow, usually in a group. The fourth way is what he calls a syntoptical reading. Uh, and there, that's a method that you're reading books together in their relation one with another. Uh, and there, Adler actually has a, um, a, a thing. I don't know if uh, Eduardo wants to pull it up. Uh, but the first, uh, th the second and the third volume of this, uh, the great books of the Western world, it's what's called the syntopicon, uh, a synthetic or a lexical index of the great books on what Adler will come up with 102 great ideas. Uh, and there's things, yes, very good. And I got mine on my shelf too. I should have brought it down. You'd be right back. These are all online too, they're in English. Uh, and so that may be a little bit more difficult. Um, but everything from aristocracy to beauty. Uh, and so one of the, the advice I would give to someone starting out and notice, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell a story too. Uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins, he was, uh, went to uh, Oberlin College in the United States and then he went to Yale. Uh, and then he was a ambulance driver in the First World War, in the Great War in, in Italy. Uh, and then he came back and finished his undergraduate degree at Yale, uh, then started at Yale Law School and ended up becoming the dean of Yale Law School. And he has a, a short little piece, and if Eduardo wants, I can I'm email it to you. Uh, but he titled it, this is when he was in his 40s, uh, it's a, um, the autobiography of an uneducated man. And he said that it was only when he got to law school that he really understood and really was taught how to read, how to read closely. But the problem is uh, there's not a lot of great books in law school. In fact, there's really none is what he said. And so it was only when he worked with Mortimer Adler uh, in his 30s when he really started to read uh, and to learn the great books. Uh, he'd been taught a close reading method, Mortimer Adler's analytic method. Uh, and he taught that in law school. And there, uh, lawyers are taught to very closely understand what words mean in a grammatical sense, and also to learn uh, dialectic and an understanding of dialectic. And there, I mean, I would go back to, to uh, 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 what the real meaning in the Middle Ages of what the, the liberal arts were, the arts of the free person. And they divided that curriculum into three and then four, the trivium of grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic. 
uh, and the quadrivium of arithmetic, geometry, uh, music, and astronomy. astronomy. Yeah, and what those are, are what I like to de describe them as words and numbers. Uh, and we'll get to the, the trivium, those are words, but the quadrivium, why music? Well, arithmetic is number in the abstract. Geometry is number in space. Music is number in time. And astronomy is number in space and time. And so if we think about that way, uh, the numbers and the mastery of numbers, that's necessary for the fully educated free individual, uh, but also an understanding of words, uh, grammar, rhetoric and logic, grammar, what words mean and how they're used to communicate meaning from one mind to another. Uh, rhetoric, uh, how to persuade, how to bring someone to act on what they have learned. And dialectic, which is logic uh, and logical fallacies and how uh, communication can be used from one mind to another using grammar, rhetoric and logic. Uh, those, are, those are the bases of the liberal arts and the professions build on those. And what's interesting with that question the, the listener had, uh, as well as my experience, as well as Hutchins's experience, we didn't get most of the grounding in the close reading methods of primary source texts in the undergraduate experience at university. Uh, we were supposed to, but oftentimes we didn't. Uh, you can't get a, I mean, Textbooks are never worth reading closely. Uh, books in you know a university might usually because they're they're secondary. Uh, it's a, a secondary mind often working through a, a series of primary minds. They're useful in their way, but it's not something that you read closely like uh, Socrates or you read like Kant or you read like uh, uh, you know other figures like Goethe or or Darwin or or some of the great thinkers or William James or Freud or Dostoevsky uh, or even Gibbon. Um, there. So anyway, I've answered that question too long. Uh, one of the things though, is you want to have a plan. Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book is a great place to start because that will describe three different methods of reading. Uh, then a broad familiarity uh, with the great books in the Western tradition. Those of us here are Westerners. Uh, we speak Western languages that come out of uh, Greek and Latin um, primarily. Uh, and this is one of the things that we want to think about uh, as we look at the question of what the West means. Uh, we started at that, uh, but we also want to think that this vision that Adler, Mortimer Adler had, uh, Mortimer Adler and Robert Maynard Hutchins, they would compile the great books of the Western world. And they did this uh, in about 1950, 1952 is when it was published. But they were doing it after the Second World War. This enormous cataclysm uh, that really threatened the destruction of Western civilization, but it was something that was worldwide. And so they put together the great books of the Western world and they're very explicit in saying it, that this is our tradition. But what we need is somebody from the East to put together a great books of the Eastern world. And so once that's done, then we can put them both together and come up with great books of the world to really envision the entire world as a global community that can think together. Uh, the University of Chicago tried to do it in the Graham School, uh, but the traditions aren't quite as, um, there's not the same kind of great conversation in the East. They're more segmented. And so when the University of Chicago uh, scholars put that together as a parallel tradition, uh, they looked really, they did, uh, they did one year on Chinese literature, Chinese classics. Then they did another year on Japanese literature, Japanese classics. Then another year on Indian classics, South Asian and then another year on the writings of Islam uh, and that tradition. Uh, but these traditions didn't talk too much. They didn't have the same, same kind of great conversation uh, that it, there is in the West. But uh, this is something that we wanna think about as a plan 
as that uh, person is describing or needing to get that plan of a full education, because you do have to have some aspects of an understanding of Chinese culture and Indian culture, at least in, in a brief way. There was one uh, scholar that actually he was the first pr uh, professor at the University of Chicago's Graham School, and he had a sort of a vision of what world literature would be from your perspective. And he was kind of first recommending understand your own tradition first, and then bring, uh, sort of branch out. Uh, and so was he was he was an Englishman. And so he said Shakespeare would loom very large from my perspective as what world literature is from my perspective would be because it's so essential to to uh, but uh, to what it means to be english uh, but if you looked at some place from brazil for example there's some key brazilian authors uh, that you would need to engage in to understand what it would need to be to to be fully brazilian uh, i'm sure that that would be the case and i uh, everyone would not come up with the same books. Eventually in the West, you would get to areas where you would overlap uh, and oftentimes significantly overlap, uh, partly become, we come out of the same tradition of Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, uh, sometimes Paris, uh, uh, and then other uh, areas that have produced significant literature. Uh, does that sort of answer that question? At least the place to start. Start with how to read a book. Uh, start with a good method, uh, then take a look at some of the texts Adler recommends in there, and then you could look at, you know, the great uh, the, the great uh, the great book series if you'd like, uh, but do it with a few other people, and like Robert Maynard Hutchins did, and like I did, you had to do it on your own oftentimes outside of university. Uh, sometimes you can get it through a university, but uh, there, as, as um, even Bill Gates said, uh, it's much better to have a great teacher than a great university, because it's that great teacher who's going to lead you the right way through significant texts. And oftentimes a, a university has sometimes great teachers and sometimes not. Uh, and so it may not be always at a university you can do this. So does that at least some guide? Uh, with there. Excellent. Uh, I have to say that my my channel Tres Vias uh, comes to Trivium uh, is is the name translated to Portuguese. Oh, okay. So that's why uh, my name the, the name of my channel is Tres Vias in Portuguese Trivium. <laughs> oh, uh, so, so liberal educations is it's uh, uh, essential in the, this channel. <laughs> uh, Wesley, come here and talk. Uh, Mr. Butler, what is the most important book in American literature? Maybe The Great Gatsby? <laughs> uh, it could. The Great Gatsby is a good text. Uh, it's short also. Uh, and and um, there are a couple others. One of the things uh, that they use centrally in the basic program, a liberal education for adults. They love um, Moby Dick, uh, Melville's Moby Dick. They love that text. Uh, that's a difficult one to look, work through. Um, there, I mean, there's some others you could go, uh, uh, somewhat it depends uh, on sort of given time period uh, that you're taking a look at. Uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man is a, a central text, a very good one uh, that can be used. Um, let's see, some right, Jack London is good uh, that you can do. Uh, Theodore Dreiser is, is oftentimes one of the ones that, that I will take a look at. Uh, Sister Carrie, but that's because I'm from Chicago. Uh, and uh, that's a book set in Chicago. Uh, there's some classic uh, books by Mark Twain. Uh, that should be really considered. They're not, and what's interesting in Adler's Great Books of the Western World, there are no American novels in there, which is interesting. 
uh, that uh, there are no American novels in there, and really about the only novels that are there. Well, I'm sorry, I, I mistake. Uh, he does have Melville. He does have Moby Dick in there, uh, and a couple other works, uh, short stories by Melville. Uh, but no Fitzgerald uh, is there. Uh, you could look for the simplicity of style, uh, works of Ernest Hemingway. Uh, Hemingway is a contemporary of Fitzgerald. Uh, but other texts as well. I, so I can't really go, what's the most important single book, uh, most important book in American literature, uh, most important novel. Uh, the Grapes of Wrath is a very classic uh, novel by John Steinbeck on questions of depression or, or the Great Depression. Uh, and economic inequality uh, is one. And so there... Maybe this goes back to, to another question that we're asking. We could put together maybe 20 uh, great American novels or great pieces of American literature. Almost all of them would have uh, uh, Huckleberry Finn on there. Uh, great Gatsby would be on there. But Toni Morrison's Beloved may be on there. Uh, and so then it will become uh, kind of a, a, it's somewhat hard to say what is the, the best of a book of literature, because sometimes can you get past the, you know, the excellence of Shakespeare? Uh, but clearly, well, that's the question of value and judgment in literature or in philosophy versus value and judgment in science. Uh, no scientist is going to go back and read, well, uh, my brother is a psychologist. Uh, by training. And so I asked, me as one taught in the great books, what is one of the most foundational texts in psychology? Uh, that will be the text of Sigmund Freud, The Interpretation of Dreams, probably one of the, the most central uh, book. And so I asked him what he thought of Sigmund Freud, and he kind of laughed. It's like nobody reads Freud in, as a psychologist. There we always look at the most recent literature, uh, because it's so quite a bit different way of, of looking at it. Uh, the professional social scientist only looks at that which is the most recent. Uh, whereas the literature, uh, one who is uh, astute in understanding questions of philosophy, questions of history, questions of literature, will go back to the great Gatsby, or will go back to Melville, or will go back to Hawthorne, or Dreiser, or Steinbeck, or uh, Sinclair. Uh, these are some of the classic American uh, literature. But then it comes a little bit more of a uh, matter of individual judgment. So I would put The Great Gatsby in one of the top 10, uh, but probably more than 10. Uh, I, I wouldn't ask you to hold me to, to 10 of them, but Huckleberry Finn or, or Tom Sawyer would be up there too. Uh, the Grapes of Wrath would be. Uh, Invisible Man would be. Uh, um, I can go with Moby Dick and a dozen others. So there it becomes on questions of judgment. How's that as an answer to the question? I, I read more nonfiction than fiction, as you could see. Hobson asks, uh, what is the great classical book of all time? One book, except, except Bible, huh? One book, if you would ask me, one book. Uh, you're asking these hard questions, right? That a number of people are going to disagree about. Uh, but yeah, um, and here I couldn't get away with with uh, saying the Bible again, right? Because he's going to push back and say the Bible. Uh, looking at the word, right? It means library. And so that's a library of 66 books. Uh, it, it's interesting, but probably one could put, uh, you know, one of the most important would be uh, Homer's Odyssey. Uh, that I would put at one of the top, partly because it's one of the first to create a kind of world, uh, telling the story of Odysseus's return from Troy back to Ithaca, uh, but the nature of the characters, his relationship with his wife, the suitors, uh, the numerous journeys uh, and, and challenge that he faces. Uh, it's very difficult to understand um, really much of the, the discussion in the West if you don't know some of those characters. Uh, and 
one of the things that to me is somewhat tragic is that recently there's been a move in American public school curriculum uh, to eliminate the Odyssey, to get rid of it, uh, and instead turning it into, you know, really recent texts that may seem to be more relevant to the present. Uh, but instead, I mean, a, a child is not, I don't know if you have down in uh, uh, Brazil, but uh, we have a, a minivan by Honda that's the Odyssey. Uh, it's named after one of the most important books in the history of the West. And here you're going to have a, a, a grade school kid not knowing the meaning of what his minivan, his parents are driving him around in. And there uh, you really want to see that we've lost so much in an understanding of this idea of the great tradition uh, or the great conversation or uh, as Adler describes it, a 2,500-year-old civilization of the dialogue uh, where we're constantly interacting uh, and even using things like the Iliad or the Odyssey to, to name our, our, uh, our vehicles. Uh, you know, you have to be able to at least some aspect of the story or to hear, you know, the siren's call, right, and understand what that will mean. Um, so that's probably, if, if you wanted to pin me down on one, I'd probably do that much easier than something like Plato's Republic. Uh, that's a classic one, and that's readable, uh, especially in dialogue with somebody else, whereas Aristotle's uh, politics or Aristotle's ethics, uh, the problem with Aristotle is we don't really have Aristotle. We have mostly Aristotle's lecture notes from his students. Uh, and so they read like lecture notes, uh, very uh, dry in some ways uh, and, and didactic uh, rather than a narrative. Uh, it's interesting, one of the friends of mine teaches, he loves teaching Plato's dialogues uh, and he makes them like dialogues. He has people act them out in class uh, with adults. It's actually a lot of fun when he does that. Uh, but there you get a sense of what it means to live within a character uh, and go interactive back and forth. Uh, and so it's interesting as we have the... Uh, Socrates is writing, or actually Socrates never writes anything down. Uh, as, as far as we know, there's no record of him. He's an oral figure and he speaks and he challenges and it's his voice. Uh, Plato is the first one who writes things down in that period. Uh, and he was the one to write down Socrates. And it's a little bit different to go from an oral to a written. Uh, Socrates worried that we'd lose our memories. And we see that now somewhat, right? Uh, we have our phones. And so nobody memorizes their phone numbers anymore. Uh, it used to be, I could still remember some of my old girlfriend's phone numbers uh, way back, you know, uh, 40 years ago, 30 years, yeah, 40 years ago. Uh, but now I can't, I, I think I know my wife's phone number, uh, but I don't know any of my kids, they're just in my phone. I've lost that memory, right? I don't need it anymore. Uh, but maybe now, if we're coming more to an oral age, we may need more things like Proverbs. Uh, if you look, you know, King Solomon knew 3,000 Proverbs, and that's an oral tradition to boil down to pieces of wisdom into a small, little, easily memorizable uh, phrase or a statement or a, a sentence. Uh, we don't need that. We didn't before when we could look it up. Now we may need to do that if we're now in a secondary phase of, of literacy. Yeah. So, I hope that answered his question, at least some ways. I gave two or three. How's that? Uh, Romulo says it, ask, Mr. Butler, do you know the work of Otto Maria Capo? No, I don't. Uh, uh, Otto Maria Capo was an Austrian that came to Brazil and make a, a great work, similar to what my other, but uh, a collection of books like history of Western literature, but uh, oh, okay, yeah. no, I don't. Um, but thank you. Let's see. Could you put that up again? Otto, Otto Maria Carpo. Okay, I will look him up afterwards. An Austrian literary critic who goes to Brazil. Okay, yes. I will need to. That's some of my assignment. He, 
he, he don't don't meet with uh, Mark Madle, but he uh, I think he uh, takes some books and, and understand about uh, about the great books here in, in Brazil. Uh, the great books was very popular in 60 so that's why i have these collections uh, many many people read in that time uh, and used to learn english uh, studying the great books so that's why automatic Capo and all those intellectuals of brazil know uh, the great books uh, well, i was a contemporary of adler uh, they both are sort of Central European, well, they Adler was born here, and but they're born within a couple of years of each other. Uh, so that same generation, that same intellectual generation, and it seems, I'm just reading very quickly, uh, Carpeau comes to Brazil in, at 39, it looks like. Yeah, he, uh, okay, yeah, so he comes over and his first book uh, in Portuguese is published almost the same year as Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book. So they're direct contemporaries. So I'm going to have to look him up uh, and read a little bit further at him. Yes, Mortimer Adler was invited to, to come to Brazil in, in that time. So uh, I have to, to research about, about that. Uh, Elder oh. uh, say amazing informations about great books <laughs> yeah that um, is. i'm looking that he actually carpo writes an eight volume history of western literature yes, but it's only uh, available in portuguese yes which, just uh, in portuguese <laughs> unfortunately it's uh uh i, I must show you okay, sure. <laughs> Okay, while well, he's getting the text. Yeah, history of Western literature. Yeah, Greek and Western. And he goes up to 20th century, including surrealism and Dadaism. Okay. Yeah, very prolific author, it seems. It is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. History of Western literature. Huge work. Um, so let's see another question here. Um, Julius says a good life. Uh, Elder, okay. Ella say it's very uh, moving. Have this tonight. This content is very good. Um, Filosofia, Ser e Pensar, very good. Geraldo Rodrigues, good evening, evening, Mr. Butler. Uh, good night, Mr. Butler. What is your opinion about the Thomas Wolfe book, especially Luke Homeward's Angel? Thank you. There, I'm going to say I'm a historian uh, and not a student of American literature. So I know hmm. of Wolf, but I have not read Luke Homeward Angel. Yeah. Uh, it's Thomas Wolfe who said you can't go home again. Uh, and maybe that's one of my uh, pieces, but I only know it by reputation. So I apologize, Geraldo, uh, but you probably know it more than I do. Hobson said, Professor Butler, uh, which book we have to read before to die? <laughs> which book do you have to read before you die? Uh, uh, Which uh, what one? What what? Book? what? Uh, I would read the Bible. Uh, I would then mm -hmm. move from there to read uh, probably. Well, how close are you to dying? <laughs> how many more books do you have? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a question. Uh, that whereas um, yes, it, it's uh, somebody asked once uh, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, what book you would bring uh, on a desert island. And Chesterton was a very public Christian. And everybody assumed it would be something that sort of pious text uh, that's there. And instead he said uh, something like Jane's book of how to build a boat. Uh, that's, that's what uh, he described if he was trapped on a desert island. Uh, so there, that's a question. What do you, book do you have to read before you die? Uh, that's a question of, of life and death. Uh, you really want to know and understand what death means. 
uh, and what it is afterwards. And so there's something you could take a look at. I mean, looking at, at uh, um, well, Plato's Apology is an interesting one. Uh, there it's what Socrates is explaining, not just the trial, but why he doesn't fear death. Uh, that's an important book to read right at the end, after he's condemned uh, to death. That's a, a short text that everybody should read to understand how Plato, and he's got a couple others. Uh, the Crito is an important one. Uh, but Plato's Apology, where Socrates describes what uh, he will experience or, or he imagines what death will be like. Uh, that's an important text that, that people should read and should have the chance to take a look at. Um, I would do that probably more than, than Lucretius, uh, if you're thinking on that. Um, but that's something that could also be read. Uh, some of it, I, I would imagine, rather than read something, if one is close to death, one uh, should write uh, and write something. Uh, it's interesting looking at, at one of the things that uh, Otto Maria Carpo had to do. He was Jewish and he had to uh, flee from the Nazis. Uh, and he understands what the nature of, of Western literature is. And you think about that, uh, you have that question as to why something happened uh, like National Socialism, uh, Nazism in, in Germany and Central Europe that forced so many people out. Uh, there, a question of, I mean, one of the great books that should be in a new volume is Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism. That's a central text to understand uh, the nature of the, the 20th century, uh, both in Nazi Germany, but also fascist Italy, uh, maybe to a lesser extent, uh, Spain, um, but also in the Soviet Union. Uh, where that sort of creates uh, uh, the mass man of uh, someone who is is really atomized, the individual against society in a group that that really doesn't think for themselves. Uh, but I, why I raise that in answer to this question, it's a very interesting book um, that actually is what, uh, it's a history of, uh, I believe it was individual Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. And it was a group of historians that were there. And what they decided to do, knowing what was happening, is they wanted to make sure that their stories were uh, taken down. And so it was this immense project of recording all the life stories that were there in the, the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. And what they did is they compiled oral histories, narratives of individual lives, uh, as long as as many photographs and that they could find. And they had large milk cans. I think there was like 40 liter milk cans. And they sealed them and they buried them all throughout Warsaw. Uh, and about four or five of them have been uncovered. Uh, and so what book should you read before death? Uh, there's a number of them. The Bible, Plato's Apology, maybe Lucretius, what is there after death, uh, even sections of, of the Odyssey where, where uh, he goes, uh, the, uh, where actually uh, Odysseus goes to visit the place of the dead and he talks to uh, 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 Ajax and Achilles. Uh, you could also read Dante. Uh, Dante's the, the, uh, uh, the Divine Comedy. The three books, but Dante would be an essential one as well. Uh, and there probably, I'm not sure how uh, different Portuguese is from the Italian, but I'm sure there's very good uh, uh, Portuguese translations of, of Dante's The Divine Comedy, uh, especially Purgatorio uh, would be helpful on that. So, but to think about it, figure out what to write uh, as well. Uh, how's that as an answer to that question? Uh, I am I am studying uh, divine comedy here in this channel. Each canto uh, we comment and talk about uh, divine comedies. We have nearly four forty forty uh, uh, videos that we make here. In th so it's uh, many times studying studying as divine comedy. Uh, I am a, I I love Dante Alighieri. He's it is a great poetry and is very, as you say, very similar to Portuguese language because Latin and this stuff. So uh, we can understand uh, many words in Italian. Uh, so 
Bibliophilia, uh, you say great content. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marco Tulio Lopes, what are your thoughts on the difference between the ro role of poetry in contrast to the novels in the liberal education? That's a very good question. Uh, and there, it's interesting, there's not as many poets in the Adler's great books. Uh, there's a few novels. Most of them, though, are works of sort of expository prose. Uh, many of them are. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking briefly, Descartes, Spinoza. Uh, Milton is there. Um, and interesting, Milton isn't taught much in American universities anymore. Uh, it, actually, you can graduate from a university, an American university in English literature without having to take a course in Shakespeare, which to me is bizarre, but okay. Uh, <laughs> that's the nature of how maybe Americans are, well, yes, yeah, so Americans are very um, present-minded. Uh, they don't want to look too far in the past and, and um, really see that that is uh, really has anything to teach us. Uh, and one uh, French observer actually went to the United States, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. This is in the 1830s. He went to the United States, and he, um, yeah, he would talk to people, and he talked to a built builder, uh, someone who was making built uh, boats, building boats, uh, and it wasn't a very good boat. And Tocqueville asked him why, and it's like, well, the science of boat building will advance so much more that I don't need to pay much attention to it now. It will continue to advance. And so he didn't go and study ancient and uh, early boat building. Instead, it was just what the present was in anticipation of the future will be better. That's an American attitude. Uh, why I bring this up on the difference between poetry and novels uh, is, one of the things that is dropping out of North American education uh, is an understanding of older literature, of ancient literature, of the classics, of the great books. Some of it is a dumbing down of uh, the system, of the educational system. Some of it may be that uh, individuals are finding a harder time to read. Uh, we've read differently. Uh, and think about it. I, I challenge you, uh, your your listeners. How different do you read since 2007? Right? Why 2007? That's when the iPhone was invented. Right? I'm sure many of your your listeners have smartphones, various types. Uh, but I read quite a bit differently than I did before 2007. I read much more superficially. I go bouncing back and forth. Uh, I read a screen and then go to another screen. It takes me quite a while to read slowly a book. Why am I doing this in a very roundabout way to answering this question? Uh, it may be it's now, especially for students, younger students, that it's easier to read poetry uh, and to closely look at shorter sections. I don't mean long epic poetry like Dante or Milton's Paradise Lost or something like that, uh, but rather a much shorter poem uh, that you can use to get a sense of what the poet is meaning in each particular word. Maybe the question of grammar, uh, that's a good way of teaching that part of the trivium. Again, to find meanings, uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, one of the great poets of, of last century, said a century ago, uh, a poem means what it means. That's he, he would be asked, for example, what this particular passage of the wasteland meant. And it's like, well, he would, you know, they would read it out and say, yes, that's what it means. Uh, and to really be thinking that there's no meaning outside that text, that maybe that poetry uh, can be better suited now for individuals who read much more uh, by a screen. And so you can use shorter, more deep passages because many of us have lost the, uh, the ability to follow long arguments or uh, very specific logical uh, expressions like they would be in philosophy. Uh, sometimes novels, uh, sometimes I, I usually would read novels 
I don't read too many novels. I read more, more nonfiction, but that's the nature of my profession. I'm a historian and, and uh, uh, focusing on expository literature rather than, than uh, nonfiction. Uh, but there, well, let me think about it. Uh, if you, you push it, it's a very good question, uh, partly because uh, we've all had the experience of, or I hope many of us had the experience of reading a book and then seeing the movie upon which it is based and saying, okay, uh, but then flipping it around of reading or of watching the movie and then reading the book and realizing that you cannot think imaginatively of the characters in the book different than what the movie was like. And so how the movie sort of forces you into that the, the vision of the director, uh, their imagination, how their characters would be. Uh, it was interesting how uh, uh, I had a, a well, I, I won't go into that expression, but uh, in some ways it may be poetry can be more accessible to people now, uh, partly because how our minds are being rewired by the screens and especially by our, our, our uh, uh, our uh, short, uh, you know, short uh, attention spans that may be changing in, in things. But one of the things that, that I always used to do, and this is, uh, this is a short anecdote, because how do you teach your children uh, about great literature, or at least literature at all, especially when you don't have too much time on your hands? And so what I would do, I had three boys, three sons, uh, and I have three sons. Uh, and one of the things we do is around the campfire, I would bring some, you know, guy poetry, some some men's poetry around there. Uh, and we'd actually would do it. We had one favorite poem that I would uh, recite. We had a house. This was in a, a couple of houses ago, uh, but we had a house that overlooked a, a small little creek. And in the yard, I built a, a place for a fire, uh, a campfire. And so when my son, my middle son was in high school, uh, he would, I wanted to, to supervise him and his friends, but also to be at a distance. And I would let them start a campfire, you know, and I would watch. And sometimes the kids came through the house and then went out to the backyard. And I could see, okay. Uh, other times they went around the house and went down to the background. And so I didn't know what they were doing down there. Uh, so I had this habit of saying, okay, if you guys do a campfire, I will go down after a half hour uh, and I'll read a poem. And they, my son was like, okay, dad. Uh, and, and so uh, first once or twice, it was kind of uh, uh, the kids were like, what is this old guy doing? Why is a dad here reading a poem? And then I would leave, you know, after reading the poem. Uh, and after that, after the first couple of times, a little awkward. Uh, but then uh, every time that he had a party or a group of friends over by the campfire, uh, they would shout out, when is the poem coming? Uh, and so I would come and I would do different poems that would uh, do it and always would do poems like uh, I would love to do poems uh, and you may laugh about this, uh, but they're good for teenage boys. Uh, this is from the poet Robert Service and he has a series in called The Spell of the Yukon of him up at the Canadian woods. Uh, with fires and with bears and with with uh, uh, and the favorite they always liked was the cremation of Sam McGee, and so is a long explanation and long uh, story. But it's a way to to uh, open uh, young people to literature. And going back, this is what the beginning of the Western canon is. Uh, Homer's Iliad and Homer's Odyssey are campfire poems. Stories of war, stories of battle, storing the rage of Achilles or the journey of Odysseus. Uh, that would draw people's attention and they're oral. And so we're in an age which is oral, much more so than the great novels of the 19th century like Dickens or, uh, or even earlier Cervantes, right? Those are print texts that you really need to go through with texts that are, you know, 700 pages or so. Now we're in an oral age, uh, and it may be poetry is a much better way. I couldn't read a book to my son and his buddies, 
but they would like the poems and they would recite them after me. Uh, and they had at least some of that poetry in their heads. Uh, so anyway, that's the short story. I think now we're in an oral culture and poetry may be a way to, to reach that, uh, to get people to understand those classics and that close way of expression uh, that is in a poem. Uh, talking about poetry, uh, do you know uh, Lusiades? Lusiades from Camões? No, it's a, yeah. it's a great, you have to, <laughs> to uh, Camões is the great poetry in Portuguese language. Okay. I will show, show you here uh, Camões. Who's Lusiades? He. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, oh, he, look your he is the great poetry about. from the, the traditions of Homer, uh, Virgil, Dante. He is not considered a great book by Martin Adler, but he is a great book of Portuguese language. Uh, all Portuguese language is based in study Lusiades. I think I think you, you can find uh, English tr translations. Yes, uh, I'm doing that. Yeah. And that, yes, that's, it, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It, it's a, a, a travel is, a poetry, poetry history uh, about, about uh, uh, traveling in sea and discoveries and battles. Oh, so it's quite like Homer and uh, Virgil is, is in the same, same context uh, like, like that in, in that sport. Oh, yes. So I, I hide. I recommend you to read. Okay, I, I just looked it up very briefly. Yes, that's, and that's a, uh, as one looks at the tradition, uh, the Western tradition, you see yes, similar Western. kinds of, uh, well, they're going to be oral, they're going to be verse form. And what that does is create a people. Uh, it creates a central story. To be Greek is to be, understand Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, to be Jewish is to understand, and at least if you use that, and is that sacred narrative in, in Genesis and Exodus. Uh, but here, yes, the, I didn't know about the, the Portuguese, but of course they would have one because they're a, a people that ends up colonizing throughout the globe. And so a, a great uh, uh, colonizing people, a great exploratory people. So of course they would have something like this and it'd be built around uh, Digama's uh, explorations, right? So yes, I'm going to have to take a look at this and, and maybe explore it. And that's the idea of, uh, we want to think about uh, great books or sort of world literature from a particular perspective. Uh, someone from Brazil is going to be connected with the Portuguese literature and is going to see the world from that perspective. Uh, someone in North America will see it from uh, a North American and English and maybe a, a German or, or French traditions, uh, depending upon migrations in that. Uh, but that is that that's one of the, the things about that great books of the Western world as a set, you know, that that thing behind you it too much feels like it's fixed, right? As opposed to, um, I like the, the metaphor of the great conversation uh, in large part because it's not a lecturer speaking a bunch of, to a bunch of passive students of a canon of texts, but rather uh, it's a table where we all have this conversation. And you, Eduardo, has just pulled up the chair. You invited me to sit at your table, uh, but now you're sitting at mine and as well. And when I start doing next time I teach, uh, and, and I'm thinking about teaching next year, um, I teach a history of Western civilization course, uh, but uh, uh, Oslo Sandes, is that correct pronunciation wise? Re please repeat, I, I cannot hear. Uh, the, the Portuguese epic. Os Lusanda? Ah, Lusiades. 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 You can, yeah, in, in English, it's quite like Lusiades. Lusiades. Lusid? Oh, okay, okay. Lusiades. 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 In, in English, Lusiades. Okay, Lusiades. Okay, uh, yes. well. Uh, come on. I, I think Mohamed didn't know 
do not know uh, Camões because uh, there there was no translation in that time that Morton Adler lived. So that's why I think he he is not uh, no. I th uh, I think the first translations that let me see for to English was made in twenty. Well, no, actually there was it was available. Uh, the first English translation is in 1776, is at least according to to the uh, quick look it up. Uh, but it was, was, it was not not so uh, well known outside Portugal. Uh, it's no, just it, one thing from Portugal and Brazil. So I think I think what my other don't don't uh, know because of these restrictions to Portugal and Brazil. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I may add some of, some of it, finding it in translation and bring at least in some of it my class next year, uh, if I do exploration, because it's a fabulous illustration of people creating a story that really solidifies a, a people in the modern age, you know, like Virgil's Aeneid, which creates the, the Romans in many ways, a story that defines who one is. Yeah, so thank you for, for telling me that, but I didn't know that before. <laughs> So thanks. So it's a great recommendations to read. So uh, another question, Bibliophilia, uh, Professor, what the future of literature looks like to you, considering the trends in books, book business nowadays? Yes, that's a, a one that's a very deep concern. I remember uh, I took a break for about fourteen years because I was a professional historian, uh, and then came back into the classroom. And I was amazed at the change in uh, reading habits over those 14 years, but also what I could assign. Uh, I was able to assign in a semester, uh, we would be together 45 hours. That's about three hours a week for about 15 weeks a year. That's a standard. Uh, and before I was able to, to assign Oh, upwards of about seven, 800 pages uh, at that, maybe 50 to 80 pages a week that the students would do and sometimes actually would push it. And these would be 18, 19 year olds. Uh, actually, sometimes I would come close to 100 pages a week. So depending. Uh, but then when I came back after 14 years break, uh, I really couldn't do much more than four to 500 pages a week or uh, a semester. Uh, and expect the students to read them. Uh, they just weren't reading as much, uh, and they weren't able to read and read closely and for understanding. And so part of that is, well, part of it's television, but part of it's more is the computer. They read a lot, but only on screen. And it's a different kind of reading. It's much more uh, superficial. Uh, you have a chance to go, you know, and to, you know, if you don't know a word, immediately look it up. Uh, but then often you don't come back. You can keep going. It was an American computer scientist actually developed this method uh, in, <coughs> it's called hypertext. And he actually put it, uh, was thinking it through in the 1940s. Uh, There's a figure by the name of Van Ever Bush. Uh, and the article is called How We May Think. And that sort of encouraged this practice of flitting around uh, on the web and sort of a constant multitasking that's there. Uh, that diminishes the prospects of the book uh, and the ability of a student to read very carefully through a book. Reading is hard. It's not something that is natural. Watching and listening are natural. Uh, you can listen much easier than you can watch uh, than read, but reading requires concentration. It requires the the learning the alphabet. Uh, so it's easier to watch and and listen than it is to actually read, and so that limits books uh, and the ability of having the transmission of ideas and even imagination through books. Now, when they get translated into a movie, okay, I get it. Uh, but then it's just the, the director's 
uh, vision. If you ever re if you ever watch the movie through the credits, or look at the movie poster that's there, uh, you'll see the you know the actor and the actresses, and then you see the director, and then you see the producer, and right at the bottom you'll see maybe in very small letters the guy who wrote the book upon which this is based. Uh, he's by no means. The Lord of the Rings by Peter Jackson. Yeah, <laughs> the bear, Tolkien, right at the bottom. Uh, now, some books, yeah, like Tolkien or like, you know, Harry Potter, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, but it's interesting. Sometimes you say the book business. And let's take a look at We'll We'll differentiate in a couple questions. Uh, the great books are a works of literature, right? They're writings on a page. Uh, but the set that's behind Eduardo uh, is a physical artifact that was sold door to door by encyclopedia salesmen uh, and that you would buy it on installments. And so you would, you know, pay such and such a month and then you would have this set. Okay. Now, that's the business part of the great books of the Western world. And it actually did become a, a very profitable business. Uh, now, every single text in the great books of the Western world are available for free on the Internet. And what you can do, and they're probably available in Portuguese, most of them on on the internet for free. And so in some ways that's so liberating. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, your parents or, or you had to buy a set that would run you the equivalent of, of several thousand dollars uh, in order to have this literature as your basis for education. Now it's free as long as you have a decent internet connection or even without it, you can download from the library and, and just have it on your device. Uh, so as a business, it's becoming much more difficult to make money uh, on writing, but now it's also much more accessible. And so larger numbers of people can have it. Uh, everybody can read Plato's Apology and they can read it for uh, not even a penny, not even uh, you know, tiniest amount of the electricity that it takes to download that. Or so there it's, it's makes it much more accessible, but also it means that you're not going to uh, really have, um, well, it's much more difficult to make a living doing it as maybe a, a great novelist, like, you know, the mystery writer, Stephen King, he can make a lot of money doing it, but the average, uh, uh, you know, serious poet, is not going to make enough uh, or many. And so many poets now end up becoming teachers of poetry at universities. So you don't have that kind of independence that's there. Uh, the future of literature, some of it is going to be positive. We could still write, uh, but I'm afraid that most of us will listen and watch. And so only a few things will be widely disseminated. Uh, and, and there, I think that one of the criteria that Mortimer Adler had for a great book is that bestseller over centuries. Uh, those books don't sell anymore, but people are, are reading them and able to read them. Uh, so, yeah, will people still be reading books in a thousand years? Probably. Uh, but they'll read them in different ways. And they maybe think about them in different ways. Uh, we won't be reading so many. And if you'd look around my uh, off my study here. I have several thousand books and my wife is like, why do you have so many? Uh, and she's constantly pushing me to get rid of them uh, or, or glean them out uh, of things. But I have no other, uh, and these cost me, you know, many years of study uh, and a substantial amount of money to purchase them. And now most of them have a difficult time even giving away uh, because so few people want to have books anymore, uh, at least in the large amounts, uh, large numbers. So there'll always be, maybe the, the book will end up being, you know, like in monasteries, you know, that same kind of, of uh, you know, civilization collapses. You'll have small little libraries and monasteries where people are, are focusing on the study. Uh, when you have a new oral age, uh, there wasn't a large number of, of literacy in the, the Middle Ages. Uh, it was a 
small elite. Uh, and so that's a long answer to a very important question. The future of literature, will people still be writing? Yes, constantly and very easily. I can type much faster than, than I can write in longhand. Uh, whether people can read that, uh, read as much, we're reading a lot less now, at least in book form, than we used to. And we're reading things that are not long uh, texts like this big, 400 pages or so. Uh, we're instead reading things that are two or three screens. And that's our, our attention span anymore. And so our attention span is diminishing. And that kind of was the reason for uh, my suggestion from the previous questioner. Uh, poetry may be more uh, easily to be understood and easily retained in an oral age uh, rather than the large novels uh, that were the, the point of a, a, a print-based culture, uh, like it was in the 19th century. Yeah, they, we don't read Victor Hugo much anymore. Uh, we watch Les Miserables on the screen, and then it's turned into a musical, uh, right? So, mm -hmm. so uh, that will, will it, really a funny, I don't know if you've had the, uh, the, the musical Hamilton. Has that been down in, in Brazil? Maybe not. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't okay, know maybe not. Maybe it hasn't been translated. It was a big smash uh, in the United States. Uh, it was built on a historical figure, uh, the American founder Alexander Hamilton, huh. and and um, uh, a very talented uh, uh, individual put it to rap music and made this rap <laughs> opera out of this. It's probably the best way to describe it. Uh, and and now people, and Hamilton is very difficult to read. He is in the great books, by the way. Uh, he wrote the large part of the Federalist Papers. Yeah, the Federalist Papers. Yeah. But they made a rap uh, opera out of it. Uh, and and uh, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Nobody went back to read the very long history book that it was written out of. They just read the... Uh, uh, the uh, the lyrics for the songs. So that's what will happen. What you'll have is maybe people in the background writing big books, and then they appear in very small type on the movie poster. That's probably the shortest version of what's going to happen. Well, you are talking about uh, great books of the Western world, but uh, this question is, is in interest to uh, we have some more information about great books of the whole world. So William is asking, what about the possibility of a collection such as the great book books, but within the whole world, the great books of the of the world, let's say? That's a, a great question. I, I talked about it a little bit before because uh, yeah. that was Mortimer Adler's vision. Uh, a friend of mine is a historian who worked on, he actually published a book on Mortimer Adler. And what he describes this is a great books cosmopolitanism. Uh, that's the, the term that he uses, this great books of the whole world. Adler knew we could do great books of the West. He challenged there to be a great books of the East so that there could be a great books of the whole, the entire world. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the Chinese are going back to the Chinese classics. And um, many of the Chinese universities now are going back to the reading of their own tradition. It's interesting to see, you kind of question, you know, scratch your head and see, because I thought Mao Zedong's communist revolution was designed to eliminate the Confucian classics. But now you have Marx and Confucius being studied in, in Chinese. Uh, it may be there can be this now great books of the whole world, uh, but it may, it, the Chinese may be reinventing their own tradition. Uh, and so there we may see uh, actually maybe not one great table, that great conversation, but maybe three or four different tables. Uh, I'd like to see that one single table of a great conversation that will be the whole world as you would add specifics and open, you know, make the circle larger, you know, add a, another seat at the table for another proposed piece of, of great literature. Uh, so yes, I think it's, I think it's a great possibility. Uh, it's interesting though, um, 
and this is something that we're looking at as you look at uh, curriculum uh, of what should be taught, because that's an important uh, aspect to this. We may have students for four years in high school and that's it, or maybe four years in university, let's say that point. Uh, and so if you add something in, what do you bring out? So if you add something in, what do you take out? And that becomes the challenge as you try to create this. Uh, and so there I would go back to uh, world literature in a perspective. And so the perspective of someone from Japan will be quite a bit different than someone from Chicago or someone from Brazil. Uh, and so from Brazil, you would of course need to bring in the, the literature of a Brazilian that most Brazilians would know, but then you would connect as well with the Portuguese as we've talked about. And then they would look much bigger than they would, for example, in, in a, a North American context or a Chinese context. But you would like to see that as you move towards at least, well, one of the things that uh, Hutchins was describing in that great conversation, the purpose of the trivium is to create community uh, around communication, right? From mind to mind. And that community or that sense of the common uh, is something that we want to make sure that we retain uh, and expand that notion of the common. And that will mean that that world literature is going to need to connect in many ways, right? Because otherwise we will not have much in common anymore and thus will be much more difficult to communicate one with another following that sort of logic uh, that's there. So yeah, I think uh, the possibility of a, a Great books of the world is that's the central vision. You should see behind that set, behind Eduardo's head, a great books of the East and maybe a great books of uh, the South, the global South uh, that's there as we look at uh, various literatures that need to come together. We can't read everything, obviously, uh, but we can sort of pick and choose to get some of the best of other traditions, uh, the ones that are best, the most formative. Uh, that's there. Yeah, thank you, William, for that question. And this interesting about uh, uh, for the uh, formation of criteria né, about uh, great books. Uh, uh, Geraldo Rodrigues asked, Mr. Butler, is Latin taught in American public school today? Uh, the short answer is only in a few very elite schools, right? only in a few very elite schools and a, as an elective. Uh, and there you will really have to find it. That's public schools. Usually you'll, you'll see it at a couple high schools that are in very wealthy areas. Uh, otherwise, no, it's not. Uh, and in, well, here, this is, this is a trend that I think is a horrible one. Um, but some universities, there's talk of eliminating classics as a department in the university. Uh, and so actually Howard University, an African-American school in Washington, D.C., is talking about eliminating its classics department, uh, which includes Latin and Greek, uh, of eliminating that entirely and sort of separating off uh, the professors into another Uh, other departments. Um, and so there is talk about eliminating even that in university settings. Now, I went, I was, I taught before coming to the University of Chicago, I taught at a small university in Wisconsin. It was a private university, but they didn't teach Latin. Uh, and they were getting rid of the teaching of German. Uh, they were reduced now to only the teaching of French and Spanish. Uh, that was all that they were teaching uh, that's there. Um, and so, yes, uh, Latin is taught in American public schools only in the very elite, very expensive ones, and then very seldom, uh, maybe some very elite private schools that's being taught. And that, to think about it, that is really shortchanging many students. Uh, I mean, it's significant to, well, just a short version, Uh, you've got to have some Greek if you're going to be a medical student because most of the body, the parts of the body are 
named in Greek, uh, because that's when that that's the tradition that goes back to to uh, Hippocrates, uh, Hippocrates, and then Galen. Uh, you need to know Greek and Latin because that's how the body is named. Uh, that's the kind of engagement with the tradition. Yes, we we know and we understand the body differently. I mean, Galen didn't understand the circulation of the blood, uh, but the body parts are named after the Greeks and the Latins. So uh, yes, uh, it's a very good question and it's not being taught. And it's important to say that in Tres Vias, our channel, we have many, many, many video videos about Latin language. I taught Latin in Latin, using Latin, because uh, it's a great language uh, we have to understand all traditions, as you say, uh, from Portugal, and we have the roots to, to Latin. So uh, I have many vid videos here uh, that, I, that I talk about uh, Latin language and uh, using this language to, to understand all, uh, all traditions. Uh, let me see here, Antonio Augusto, about the great nav navigations, os Lusíadas, is to Portuguese as what Divine Comet is to Italian. Uh, yes, it's quite quite so. Uh, Lusíadas is is very 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 important in Portugal and so in in Brazil too. Uh, let me see. Yeah, that's in, that's interesting. That didn't come in. Yeah, yeah, it, we it, can... it didn't come in. It, it didn't reach into the the tradition of the West. Yeah, at least in in North American context. Yeah, we let's say. If the Lusiades are not in Adler collections, it's Adler's fault, not Camões. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe. I, I think it's quite a, a question of criteria, perhaps. Uh, so I, I, I have to see the great ideas in Lusiades. I have to, to, to see what, what uh, are uh, this, this, this time perspective that we have to see. Uh, I don't know if Martin Adler uh, have to study Lusiades, uh, as, as I say, uh, it was not not too much close closely uh, before. So I, I think I think I think perhaps maybe that, that uh, it was a book read only, I think quite in Portugal and Brazil and uh, so that's why I think what other didn't know. But uh, I, I know that uh, Cervantes um, knew uh, Lusidas and, and have some contact with, with that book. So uh, that's why I think uh, Cervantes said that Lusidas have a, a, a beautiful language in, in Camões. But uh, after all... <laughs> Uh, and it may be if we go back to Adler's criteria, uh, yeah. it's not a bestseller outside the Portuguese language um, that, that, you know, a dozen centuries within the Portuguese experience from the 1570s on, um, but it doesn't make into sort of North American curriculum or English curriculum. Uh, that could be a, a, a factor of, of its uh, uh, publication in, in Portuguese. Uh, but yes, I think it is uh, Adler's fault in some way. Uh, it's popular. It seems to be almost contemporary. I, I'll have to take a look at this uh, and examine it further. You mentioned his fourth criteria. It's the most readable, right? Uh, a masterpiece in writing. And it, I don't know it. it. It may be. It's very clearly formative in a Portuguese and a Brazilian experience. Uh, his fifth is that which is most instructive, enlightening, because original. They contain that which is found, uh, that cannot be found in other books. And here it looks like this is a, a very possibility because it's a, a national epic, but it's on the uh, Portuguese exploration, right? Uh, right. And, and that's something new that's here. If you've ever read Columbus's journals, they're tedious. They're not great literature. Uh, this may be, and, and uh uh, that originality or that uh, influence, that, that's something that uh, doesn't contain what can be found in other books. That, that is a very important contribution. Yeah. yeah. Meno, Meno said, uh, Lusidas is 
is a book that that's not so well known outside Brazil and or Portugal. Uh, that's 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 uh, a good good reason. Uh, uh, let, let me see here. Um, uh, so many questions. I oh. have to se select someone. Uh, many people watching in this hour here in Brazil. Oh, that's good. How many people are watching? I think it's um, 20, 27 now. Oh, good. Okay. Very yeah, good. <laughs> uh, we, we began uh, with that number. So, uh, let me see. Uh, who is who is Morten Adler? I think he already talked about, but uh, I would like to, to talk more about what we had. He is asking. Uh, okay. Um, yes, Morten Adler is, is very influential in the United States as a popular philosopher, put him that way. Uh, he's seen as an educational reformer, although uh, he's not always followed that often. He's very much associated with the great books and that great books project. And he actually was on television quite often uh, up until his death. I had a chance to talk with him once on the phone. Uh, I was actually working on something in a project and wrote him and, and uh, he talked, but that was shortly before he passed away. Uh, he lived quite a long time, uh, but he was a very controversial figure because of the nature of the great books. Uh, and towards the end, he did not, really have the the broader vision of that great books cosmopolitanism and so it became seen as as a political project uh, and politicized uh, in such ways and there I think it's um, well there was uh, this goes back in 1988 there was a real fight at uh, one of the major American universities Stanford University uh, over the teaching of Western civilization and the great books, and even many of the, the students or radical ones uh, would actually chant, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western civ has got to go. Uh, Eduardo may have heard that. Uh, and it was out of the Stanford curriculum. Uh, and that was one of the leading universities there. Uh, it's one of the leading, one of the top five universities in the United States. Uh, and that was in 1988 that the curriculum was was eliminated. And so uh, the very notion of the West and Western tradition uh, is something that uh, was associated with Adler and others, of course. Uh, but as that tradition became seen as politicized, uh, his influence has diminished somewhat, uh, which in some ways is, is disappointing. Uh, you want to have uh, just like a, well, one of Adler's visions is a people is created by a common text or a series of texts, right? If we go back, the, the Hebrew Bible is that which is creates the Hebrew people or the Jewish people. Uh, and they know that sacred literature and that sacred narr narrative. And whether you're a believer or Jewish or not, uh, it's clearly what enabled uh, Jews to survive for millennia even without a state, is they had that national story that constituted themselves. And Adler was seeing, trying to say that, you know, it's of the West that we need to have a story, uh, a common text that, that is in this great tradition or that great conversation of significant dialogue that have significant benchmarks of what it means to be, uh, those were a literate Westerner. Uh, one who is able to articulate what that tradition means. And so if you don't know who Socrates is, you really have a problem in understanding what it means to be Western on certain ways. And so the, I go back to those cities of Athens and Jerusalem and Rome and Paris and looking to a North American context, London and Philadelphia. Uh, those are formative cities of what constitutes a North American. 
Uh, Brazil is going to have a slightly different one. That's why world literature in a, a different tradition. Uh, but but uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if there's a Brazilian Mortimer Adler. Uh, maybe Eduardo is filling that role in some ways. Uh, but as a way to uh, preserve that which is in the past and pass it on uh, to another generation uh, and help to make that education sort of shape uh, what uh, the future will be, because the great books, and Adler argues, are contemporary. They speak to us now and help us now to live as better people. Uh, what uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins always used to like to say, um, and let me give you a quote, because I think we're running close to time, right? Uh, Eduardo, I don't know what our time is, but uh, uh, let's see. Um, I want to make sure I get the quote right uh, because I, I like it. And I usually will end my uh, talks with this as I, when I teach students because he calls us uh, liberal artists. And I wanted to, to think about it. I don't know if that'll translate well into Portuguese, but I would imagine it would. Those who study the liberal arts of which the great books are a part. I mean, clearly there's music and there's uh, uh, great artworks like paintings uh, that's there. But uh, Hutchins describes us as liberal artists. And so as he says, we all practice the liberal arts well or badly all the time, every day. But as we live in the tradition, whether we know it or not, so we are all liberal artists, whether we know it or not. And as we should understand the tradition, this is quoting, as well as we can in order to understand ourselves, so we should be as good liberal artists as we can in order to become as fully human as we can. Because that's what the purpose of this is, to become fully human by engaging with those in the past and in the present in our understanding of what the ideas that we need to live. Eduardo. Maybe I need to get going because my wife's waiting for dinner. Yes. <laughs> we have two, two hours here. That's a, a good time, a good conversation. Uh, William say thanks for this time with us, Professor Birdley. It's, it's a joy to listen to you. Thanks. Uh, many people here saying, Marcus Aurelio, uh, congratulations for this work. It's very, very good. Uh, many people. Thank you uh, to have you this time and talk with us about great books, about the, this moment, about Watchman Adler, that I'm a, a huge, huge fan. And I read uh, last, uh, in the last uh, two weeks ago, uh, we have in Brazil uh, two new books translated of Watchman Adler, a Paideia Proposal and uh, I think Philosophical Errors, uh, something like that was published here that uh, it's uh, a great uh, conquer. Uh, I think many people will try to translate all works of what my other day. We have some groups that read the, the great books here to me. Uh, so uh, it's my, my honor, it's a, it's a great honor to have you here this night. And uh, in this channel, we will work with liberal education, try to uh, make people read, and not just uh, just listen or watch a video, but read these books and comment and make uh, great a great conversation, uh, and especially uh, having contact with some uh, good professors like Fred Butler. Uh, so. Thank you, uh, all you that uh, sent sent questions. It's uh, I very, very. I'm very glad uh, to to that people that uh, follow me in this this channel. So, Fred, uh, please tell us uh, your last last words to our audience. Well, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here, and I really am excited that you're continuing to keep the great book tradition alive. Uh, because we are all liberal artists, and we need to become much better liberal artists uh, to live as uh, best we can. Uh, and that requires to participate, not only to understand, 
but to equip ourselves to participate in that great conversation that lasts for has lasted for 2,500 years and will last at least 2,500 years more uh, because we have a chance to participate and contribute to it. So thank you very much, Eduardo, and all the listeners uh, for the honor to be here. Uh, and thank you for that great work that you're doing. Thank you. Have a nice time. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night.